Amen. Amen. Hey, we're in this series. We're concluding the series called Church Hurts. Healing is coming. And we have um, just really been in a season this month of healing and really figuring out the things and the places that we've been heard. And we've come to realize that none of us are immune to church hurt. And none of us are even immune to hurting other people in the church. We're all human beings. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, as Romans talks about. And so we've all either experienced church hurt or we've been the ones who have hurt other people in the church unintentionally. And we figured out that we've got to figure, we, we have come to realize that we've got to figure out how do we move past the church hurt. And we have talked about how sometimes it takes perseverance. And we've got to just keep getting up and keep going. Last week we talked about unity. We talked about bearing with one another in love. And how that literally means in the Greek, putting up with each other in love. And uh, I am just, man, I've, that's been playing in my mind all week. Like, I just got to put up with this person in love. You know what I'm saying? And it wasn't Steve, so just, <laughs> just to say, I'm just putting that out there. Um, and so uh, I love that we're concluding this series today. You know, if you don't know a little bit about me, uh, my dad is a pastor, my brother is a pastor, my uncle is a pastor, and my grandpa is a pastor. So four pastors have gone before me. I am the fifth and the only female, which is pretty cool. Um, actually, my aunt is ordained. I should say that. She's ordained, and she is married to my uncle, who's a pastor. But, you know, in our church family, there have been different seasons when each of these pastors in my life have been hurt at one time or another. And luckily, I don't have to deal with a whole lot of what they've dealt with here at the gathering because you guys are so amazing. Uh, but I remember this one season when I was like in middle school, my dad had gotten really hurt by uh, someone in the church, actually someone that was on his staff. And I remember I was so upset about it. Like, don't come after my family. Like, you can come after me all day, but don't come after my family. You know what I'm saying? And I remember being so upset, and I was in the bathroom one day, and I was just giving this guy a piece of my mind. I mean, like 11 years old, just giving him a piece of my mind, just saying all the things I wanted to say to his face. And my mom comes up the stairs, and she is listening through the door, and she thinks I've called the guy. <laughs> yeah. And luckily, she's like, Stephanie, Stephanie, what are you doing? And I'm like, Nothing. I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> but, you know, we, we like to stand up for people, especially our family, when someone gets hurt. I'm telling you, our, our worship pastor, Katie Driver, who was just up here, is an Enneagram 6, which means she's a loyalist. And so I have seen this woman. Yes, so is Selena. You do not want to get on their bad side. Listen, you do not want to attack somebody that's close to them because I've seen how she defends me sometimes. And I don't ever want to be the person that is on your bad side. I just want to say that. I won't. Okay, great. I'm so glad to know that. But listen, sometimes we, we defend and, and we, we like to try to defend the people that are closest to us. We like to try to, when someone close to us has been hurt, we like to try to ease that burden a little bit. And I think Luke has something to say to us about this. He has something to say to us when we've been hurt, when we've been mistreated, when we've been betrayed. So let's turn together to Luke chapter 6. We're not going to read the whole chapter like we did last week. Man, that was a doozy in Acts. But we're going to read Luke chapter 6 verses 27 to 42 out of the NLT, the New Living Translation. <coughs> it says this, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. If you love only those who love you, what credit do you get for that? Even sinners love those who love them. 
And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners lend, will lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful. He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others, or it will all come back against you. Forgive others, and you will be forgiven. Give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Then Jesus gave the following illustration. Can one blind person lead another? Won't they both fall into a ditch? Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, friend, let me help you get that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Jesus, we ask that you would come, that you would make your word real and alive and fresh to us. Give us ears to hear today, God. I dedicate every word I say to you in Jesus' name. Amen. This command here in Luke chapter 6 is the most discussed and the most debated command in all of Scripture. It is the most discussed command in all of Scripture. It is the most debated command in all of Scripture. Love your enemies. I mean, it really is the one thing or one of the main things that separates Jesus' teachings from a lot of other religious teachings, a lot of other uh, ideologies that you'll hear out there. You don't hear other religions or other people in the world, other philosophers, you don't hear people saying, hey, go and love your enemy. Go and love the people that have hurt you. It really is what sets Jesus' teachings apart from any other teaching in the world. It's the most discussed and the most debated of his teachings. Jesus' teachings are summed up really in one word, love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, and love even your enemies, even the people who do you wrong. We talked a little bit about it last week, but there are three different main types of love in Greek, uh, in Greek literature, in, Greek, in the Greek language. There are a lot of different ones, but they focus really on three. Philea is the, the one, and you might, you know, recognize it in the, the uh, city Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This Philea word is the word used for a love between a brother and a sister or a sibling, kind of that, that love that you have for family. The eros word in Greek is the word between the love between a, a husband and a wife, the love between that intimate kind of love. And then there's the word agape. And this is the love that only can be described as the love that God the Father has given to his creation by giving up his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. That is the kind of love that God demonstrates for us by giving us his only son. And it's the kind of love here that Luke 6 is talking about, that kind of love to your enemies. See, agape love is not an emotional kind of love. It's a love of the will. And so I don't have to feel like I love you in order to love you is what agape love means. I don't have to feel all the warm and fuzzy things. I don't have to feel like I'm going to get you a dozen roses or I'm going to get you some candy or I'm going to go and say really nice things to you. No, it's, it's making my will submit to the fact that Jesus has called me to love you even if you're my enemy. 
even if you're someone who's hurt me, even if you're someone who's cursed me, agape love says, I will will myself to show you love, even if you're my enemy. One of the commentaries I read this week says this about agape love. It's a benevolence towards someone, a love of the will. It means that no matter what that person does to us, we will never allow ourselves to desire anything but their highest good. We will deliberately go out of our way to be good and kind to them. Love your enemies. We love them with our will. I love that that quote says we do not allow ourselves to, to uh, express anything to them but wanting their highest good. See, we can take our will, we can take our emotions, we can take our love, and we could submit it to Jesus. And when we submit it and surrender it to Jesus, he helps us love even the people that are the most unlovable. How do we love our enemies? Luke chapter 6 says, do good to those who hate you. I want you to think about this for a moment. How can I choose, how can I will myself to do good to the people that hate me? And that's a little bit like dramatic maybe. Like in my everyday life, I don't walk around thinking that people hate me necessarily or that I hate anybody else. But there are times when things get under my skin, and it's happened a lot this week, and I think it's because I'm preaching on church hurt. The devil's trying to get me. But there are times when things get under my skin, and I think, God, what do I do in this situation? It might not be that someone hates me. It's, it's definitely not that I hate someone else. But I have to ask myself here in Luke 6, it says, do good to those who hate you. How can I do good to those maybe that are just getting under my skin? How can I do good to those when they offend me? How can I do good to people when we're at odds with each other? See, I choose, I have to will myself, will my emotions to say, no matter what comes, I will choose to do good to you. No matter what comes, I will choose to bless you. Jesus, in this passage, in Luke chapter 6, says, bless those who curse you. I want to ask you to think about the question, how can I bless my enemies? How can I offer them a blessing? A lot of you have told me this series is not just good for church hurt. It's good for our family communications as well. It's good to have these kinds of sermons because we've all got relationships in our lives, in our families, in our workplaces, in our like social lives, our friends. We've all got relationships that sometimes are at odds with each other. And we've got to ask ourselves, how do I do good to the people who are at odds with me? And how do I bless them? He says, bless those who curse you. Bless those you're at odds with. Do good to those you're at odds with. It says, this is, this is audacious, this next one. This is just radical. Pray for those who hurt you. This separates Jesus' teaching from any other teaching in the world. Jesus says, what do I do to my enemies? I do good to them. I bless them, but I don't just stop there. I pray for them. I pray for the people that have hurt me. If you're wondering, how do I let go of church hurt? How do I let go of family hurt? How do I let go when my friend hurts me? How do I forgive them and truly know that I've forgiven them? How do I even get on the path to forgiving them? Jesus tells us right here in Luke chapter 6, pray for them. Pray for them. It's going to feel uncomfortable at first. It's going to feel weird. And I don't want you to do what that country song says about praying that they'll fall off a cliff or whatever. <laughs> like that's not the kind of praying that we're talking about. I want you to genuinely pray for them. I want you to genuinely pray that the Lord would do good for them, that the Lord would humble them, that the Lord would bless them, that the Lord would help me to love them, help me to will myself to love them. 
how do I do that? Well, it starts by just saying, hey, God. Hey, God. I really don't want to do this right now, and this is really hard. But I really am asking you to help me love this person. I'm really asking you to bless this person. I'm really asking you to do good in their lives. And the moment we begin to pray for someone is the moment that unforgiveness begins to lift from our hearts. There is power in your prayers. Do to others as you would have them do to you. This is the golden rule in Luke chapter 6. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And as I was reading different commentaries about this scripture, a lot of them said, You know, you hear this in just language, in rhetoric, in the negative form. Like, don't do this to other people so they don't do it to you. But Jesus takes it a step further and says, do to other people what you would have them do to you. Don't just avoid doing things to to other people that are wrong. Don't just avoid doing negative things, but actually do good things to the people, even that are enemies of yours. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. How do we take this golden rule and apply it in conflict? How do we take it and apply it in church hurt? How do we take it and apply it in our family hurt? We ask ourselves, how would I want the other person to treat me in this conflict, in this hurt? I know I wouldn't want them to to be defensive, so I can't go into this conversation defensive. I know I wouldn't want them judging me, so I can't go into it judging them. I know I wouldn't want them condemning me. I know I wouldn't want them to be condescending to me, so I'm not going to be those things to them. How do I want them to treat me in this conflict? And that's how I should treat them. I love this extra little part that Jesus puts in here. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? (laughs) Even people that don't love Jesus do that. And if you do good to people that only do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even people that don't love Jesus can do that. See, we're called to be set apart. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to be different than just every Joe Schmo walking along the street. See, every Joe Schmo can love the people that love them. Every Joe Schmo can can do good to the people that do good to them, but we are called to be different. We are called to be set apart. And so when someone hurts me, when someone offends me, when I've got a deep wound from someone, I'm called to rise above it through the grace and strength and mercy of Jesus and to love them and to pray for them and to bless them. We love our enemies by sowing into them, by treating them how we'd want to be treated. I want to talk about sowing and reaping for just a minute. Sowing and reaping. We all know the concept that when we sow a certain seed, we get something that the seed produces in farming. We sow a seed, we get something in return. It's the same in the spiritual realm. What we sow into other people, we will get back. And so Jesus here in Luke 6 says, do not judge or you will be judged. So if I don't want to be judged, I can't go around judging other people. Jesus said, do not condemn or you will be condemned. If I sow condemnation into my friendships, into my relationships, into my family, into my enemies, I will receive condemnation back. On the flip side, Jesus says, forgive and you will be forgiven. That's powerful. That is powerful to forgive Someone means that I, in turn, will be forgiven by God. I have to reverse that and ask the question, if I choose to not forgive someone, does that mean I will not be forgiven? There are scriptures that say just that. 
if I let unforgiveness root itself in my heart, God says, I can't forgive you because you're not forgiving them. So we have to sow forgiveness into people's lives if we ourselves want to be forgiven. Luke 6 says, give and it will be given to you. And I was always curious what the, the next verse meant about being pressed down and shaken together and making room for more to overflow and be poured into your lap. And I was studying about that, and it said they had these, like, pockets on their robes that they would stuff wheat in back in Jesus' day. And they would shake it down and press it together so that there would be room for more to put more wheat in there. And it would overflow. And Jesus here is saying, if you give, more will be given to you. If you give, if you sow giving and generosity, more will be given back to you. That's how you get more is to give then. So sowing and reaping. My stepson is trying to grow a green pepper in our living room. <laughs> I just found this out. There was a little plant on the windowsill and I was like, it just like looked like grass, just, I don't know. I was like, what is that? Steve goes, well, Mike was cutting a green pepper the other day. He got one of the seeds. He went outside and got some dirt with some grass, planted the seed in the dirt with the grass, and now it's sitting on our windowsill. He's hoping to get a green pepper from it. I don't know a lot about farming, but I don't know if it's going to work or not. <laughs> And I don't know a lot about farming, but I do know that if you plant a certain seed into the earth, you will yield fruit. You will yield the thing that you're planting. And you will yield more of it, much more of it than the seed represents. So if I plant corn seeds, I will reap corn. If I plant a pumpkin seed, I'll reap pumpkin. I had to, I had to Google what do you plant to get potatoes, even though I grew up getting potatoes with my grandma out of the garden. But you plant potato seeds. And then you get real potatoes. If you plant something into the ground, you will reap the same thing, even bigger than the seed that you put into the ground. We know this, this basic law of nature, that what you sow, you can expect to get back. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us here in Luke 6. That whatever we sow into others, we can expect to get back on ourselves. So if I sow judgment, I will reap judgment. If I sow condemnation, I will reap condemnation. If I sow love, I will reap love. If I sow forgiveness, I will reap forgiveness. If I sow generosity, I will reap generosity. It's that easy. It's that simple. God is calling us to forgive. God is calling us to love the people that have hurt us, to forgive them by praying for them, by doing good to them, by blessing them, by treating them how we would want to be treated. And then Jesus ends Luke chapter 6 by telling us to look inwardly. He says, look inwardly. Before you try to take the speck out of your enemy's eye, examine the log that is in your own eye. I mean, Jesus has some wittiness about him. Like, that's kind of funny. If you're like one of his disciples and he's like, what, that's speck and log. No, take the log out of your eye before you try to examine the speck in someone else's eye. He's basically saying, don't try to fix your enemy before you take an inventory of yourself. We see this again in the <clears throat> the woman caught in adultery. Remember, they were gathered around her trying to stone her. They were about to stone her to death. And Jesus, they asked Jesus, what should we do? And Jesus boldly proclaims, let each of you who have never sinned cast the first stone. And one by one, they walked away. Because they knew they too had sinned. They knew they were not unguilty they were not without sin so they couldn't throw a stone hypocritically because they knew they also were guilty of sin Jesus in essence here is saying you have no room to talk to other people about how they offended you you have no room to talk to other people about how they've hurt you look at yourself 
Examine yourself before you worry about other people. And so I have to start with me. I have to start with me. I have to start by asking myself, what are my motives here in this conflict? What do I need to take responsibility for in this e offense? I need to check my attitude. I need to check, am I being condescending? Do I have an attitude? Am I being overly sensitive? All of these questions, how am I doing? Let me examine myself first. My motives, my expectations, my responsibility in this conflict. And then I can move to them. But I can't examine them until I examine me. Hypocrisy is often what makes conflict so hard. We go into confrontation with the other person, and the other person is thinking, yeah, you have room to talk. Look at what all you've done that you don't even bring up right now. Conflict makes us blind to what our part of responsibility is. A person who is blind to their part in conflict cannot lead another person to see their own responsibility in the conflict. I've got to start with me. I've got to take responsibility for me. And when I take responsibility for my part in the conflict, darkness comes to light. And when the darkness comes to light, it allows light to be shown on every part of the conflict. When we own our responsibility in a conflict, we set the other party at ease. We help them take their guard down. And we help them go from a fighting posture to a receptive posture. Here's the thing. I can't control how others treat me. And I can't control when others hurt me. But I can control me. My response, my reaction, and my love towards the other. I've had a pretty rough week, and I've had, I've mentioned that a bit earlier, but um, I've, I've just had opportunities left and right to be offended, and I've had to choose to, ha I've had to choose to look at myself first inwardly. Where is my part in this conflict? Where is my part in this offense? How do I take responsibility right now for what's going on inside of me and how I've contributed to this? That's what we've got to do, friends, if we're going to heal from church hurt, if we're going to heal from family hurt, if we're going to heal from friend hurt. I want to invite the band to come. As we prepare our hearts to respond to the message today, I want you to just bow your heads and I want you to begin to take that self-examination with me. I want you to begin to ask yourself, is there anyone I need to forgive in this season? Is there anyone I need to forgive? Maybe you take this response time and you just begin to pray for that person so that God can move in your heart and help you through prayer begin to forgive them. Where do you need to take an inventory of yourself and take responsibility for your part in the conflict? And then ask God to help you not be hypocritical, but to really own what part is yours. Where do you need God to help you love other people, your enemies, the people that have hurt you? Where do you need him to help you love them? And where do you need God to heal you? These are the questions I want you to ponder and think about this week. And these are the questions I want you to ponder and think about during this response time as we sing this last song. We're going to sing the words, God, I want to move your heart. And so I pray that as we own our own stuff today, that we would move his heart. As we pray for our enemies, as we bless those who persecute us, as we do good to those who harm us, I pray that God would release his healing to our hearts. As we need to set boundaries in our lives, that he would release healing. 
that chains would be broken. So God, we pray right now for those of us who are struggling with church hurt or family hurt or friend hurt or coworker hurt, whatever it might be, God. I pray for healing to come. Help us to pray for our enemies, to bless those who persecute us, to do good to those who harm us, God. And as we do these things, Jesus, would you just come and move in us? And I pray that as you move in us, we 